Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to introduce our three-time Masters champion, Phil Mickelson. Phil, welcome to your 29th Masters. Looking back a bit, 30 years ago in 1991, Phil first appeared as an amateur here. And to remind you what a career he had as an amateur. He was, he came in as the U.S. Amateur Champion, a three-time NCAA individual champion while at Arizona State. He had already won a PGA Tour event in 1991 as an amateur, the last amateur to do so. And in the 1991 Masters, Phil was low amateur. Uh, so Phil, you've been playing golf at a world-class level for, for 30 years, and we know you're not done. Last it's November, uh, Phil opened the tournament with a 69 and a 70, again showing how well-suited his game is to Augusta National. And we've had a, an abbreviated uh, period of time since November for this Masters. Phil, how have you been going about preparing your game? Well, I love being back here. I'm excited that we are able to hold this tournament, and I'm appreciative of us holding this event back in November and making it possible in 2020 uh, when it was a rough year. But it's fun for all golfers as a kid to dream about this event and play and participate in it. Uh, I love I love coming back here. And uh, my game, I think, is, it feels better than the scores have been. But uh, I've got some work to do. And, and it's been a fun challenge for me to get back to playing at a high level. Great. Let's open it up for questions. Steve? Well, on Sunday... I think we taught, we saw you hit balls for three hours. You were on the putting green for about an hour and a half, two hours. You played a practice round. Did you find anything on Sunday? So, um, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I had some work to do to make sure that uh, I had the setup in the bag that I wanted and that when I practiced – uh, this week that I was working with the right clubs that I wasn't searching for things and that, that uh, everything was dialed in. And so, um, I thought it went, I thought it went well. I feel like I'm playing well. I've got, uh, some good things going. I've made some progress, but, um, I haven't played at the level I expect to recently. And, uh, I, again, I, I actually enjoy the challenge of, uh, getting my game back because, there's really nothing physically holding me back from playing at, at the highest level, but mentally uh, I've got to be sharper and uh, I, I'm working on that. I'm, I'm, and I'm enjoying the challenge of, uh, of playing at the highest level. Tim. Well, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I caught you sneaking a look or two at that rather iconic image, even with all you've done with all you've, all you've done in the game, all you've won, where do moments like that still rank for you? So that's that's one of my uh, top two. I mean, that that is probably uh, the greatest joy that I've felt. You know, the relief of the pressure of why haven't I won a major to winning the Masters and being part of the history of the game and sharing it with my family and just uh, a, a very special moment in my life. And um, the greatest feeling of accomplishment, I think, was winning the British Open in 2013 because... It wasn't really a style of golf that was suited to my game, but I had played so well here for so many years that I knew it was a matter of time before I broke through and won. And I, I never really doubted that I would end up, you know, winning this tournament. It's a course that was very well suited for the way I grew up playing. Uh, but that joy of winning it for the first time, finally breaking through is, uh, you know, it's beyond belief. Every time I see that, uh, it's become my logo, and it brings out emotion in me every time I see it. It's a, it's a very, uh, for me, uh, powerful thing to, to uh, bring out the emotion of accomplishing my personal major championship. You know, in, the, in this case, it might be golf, but for other, everybody else, it might be their own major in, in, in their job or their family or what have you. And uh, that, that just elicits a, a, an emotional response from me every time I see it. Back much? Not at that place yet where you reminisce. A little bit of both. Like I look, I, I look back and I enjoy all, all the things that uh, I've been able to experience, mainly because of the game of golf. And I look back at, uh, uh, but yet I still look forward at, at, at the challenges that uh, I need in my life to get the best out of me. Colin, hey Phil, um, fast forwarding to tonight's Champions Dinner. Um, how are we feeling about the pigs in the blanket? We, you a fan or what's up? 
I'm always open to whatever the Masters champion has to try. I, I've uh, tried a lot of different cuisine over the years. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I remember I'll share it with you a little little funny story uh, from Adam Scott's victory, and he had uh, had this wonderful meal, Australian themed, and out comes dessert, and it's pavlova. It's uh, meringue with some fruit and so forth. And I said, no, no, there, you can't Google this stuff because our cell phone, you know, there's no cell phones allowed, right? And I said, oh, uh, Pavlova, that's uh, inspired by the great Russian ballerina Anna Pavlova, who was touring through New Zealand, Australia. And the Australian chef was so inspired by her beautiful movement and tutus, she ended up uh, naming, he made, made a dessert after her. Chairman Payne looked at me like, what kind of stuff are you spewing here, you know? And uh, no, no, this is, this is true. You know, Zach, Zach Johnson looks at me and says, I got $100, says that's not right. You know, so everybody's calling me out of my BS. And a lot of times I am BSing. However, <laughs> however, my daughter was a dancer. And she wrote a biography on Anna Pavlova. And I made 32 Pavlovas for her class when she was a little girl. And I knew this. And I ended up, you know, being right, which is not often. And I was right on that particular moment. So th some of these moments that goes down in Champions Dinner uh, are, are, are special. And that was, uh, you know, that was cuisine inspired. James. James, yes. Question. Bill, okay. I'm just curious. Um, sometimes you have a dream of being, you dreamed of being here and it doesn't quite live up to your expert. Did this even surpass your dreams of what this would be like to play here? Yeah, probably. I mean, when I look at um, what's transpired in the last 30 years, 29 years since I first played here, and all of the things that have uh, changed over the years, like I, I would never come up with some of the, the incredible ideas that have taken place from the acquiring the land and making that, you know, the driving range and uh, what it is and making the parking and the experience for the patrons, patrons what it is and the media center here and the tunnels. And the, it's just the details of and the depth with this, the way this has been so well thought through and no tournament treats their players and past champions better than, than this tournament right here. So it just uh, has an incredible feeling as a player when you when you are here and the way they take care of us and how well run everything is. Christine. Hi, Phil. Uh, as you know, outside the gates here, Georgia has been in the news of late with the new voting law. And Major League Baseball, of course, just pulled out, pulled the All-Star game uh, out of Georgia, as I'm sure you're aware. Is your sport doing enough to combat this law, especially with the game's stated efforts on diversity and inclusion? Thank you. I, I'm really not knowledgeable on state laws through across the United States and all the laws that we have. I'm aware of some from California that we have, and we tend to be the leader in a lot of that area as far as uh, human rights, civil rights, diversity, and so forth. And I'm proud of that. And uh, hopefully, uh, as a Californian, although, I'm, although I'll be moving soon, but uh, we lead by example. And so I'm not really familiar with the details of the law you're talking about, but um, I do believe in um, the rights in treating all people equal. And I hope that... Uh, as a California, we lead by we lead by example, and that others will follow suit. Robert, oh, hey. um, do you prefer? Does it suit you to have the course this firm, and can you compare it to? Obviously, it's not the same as November, but to other April Masters of recent vintage. I mean, is it is it setting up to be faster and firmer than we've seen in a while? I would say for the last decade, the the uh, greens here are in the uh, top 25% of softest we play on tour. And the golf course's only defense is the greens, right? So when the greens are firm, it, the precision 
the course management, the angles, the leave where the ball le is left, um, all of this stuff becomes incredibly important in your ability to play this course effectively. When the greens are soft, it's irrelevant because you can fly the ball over all the trouble. Angles don't matter. I plugged a five iron last year or last November into the second green. It plugged. So the guys are so uh, precise in their ability to fly the golf ball the correct yardage with every club that if you have soft receptive greens, it's like having a military w and then not giving them any weapons, right? It, it's defenseless. And so uh, with firm greens, that's the defense. It's not like we have, there's no U S rope and rough here. There's no tight fairways and uh, the defense is the greens, right? And so even though the course was made longer, the ability for all, all the best players to fly the ball a specific yardage with whatever club, whether it's a five, six, seven, eight, iron, if the ball stops on those sections, they're, they're going to eat this course up every course. However, when the greens are firm, those small sections are very hard to hit and you've got to really strategize on where you leave it. That's the whole defense of the golf course. So if it's firm, I think it's going to be uh, a real test. And look, we, the major champions should challenge the major championships should challenge and test the best players. It's hard to set, but it's really a hard job to set a golf course upright because you're always trying to find the line and not crossing it. And it's just, it's a tough thing to do. But uh, I think with, with firm greens, this golf course needs to be respected. And I don't think, it, I think it's been a long time since it's had to be respected. You think there was any, any sense of trying to make sure that it's, more difficult based on DJ shooting 20 under, you know, a tournament record. I realize it was November and different. I don't know, but I would say that there's nobody more qualified within the club to, uh, to know, understand and set the golf course up better than the chairman, Fred Ridley. I mean, his ability to play the game, to understand the game at the highest level. Uh, I think he's the most qualified to, to do it right. And, um, I think he is. Tara. So, over to you, Rhett. Um, you talked about the treatment of past champions, you know, and how special and different that is here. It seems to me, at least, that part of that is sort of becoming these de facto spokespeople for the course and the tournament and all that. H have you ever struggled to reconcile at all some of, like, Augusta's past policies and being asked about those, even though you're just a golfer here and then still loving it as much as you do, but sort of knowing some of that, can you, is that just a balance or do you, have you ever felt yourself needing to reconcile that? When I was a kid, I grew up dreaming of winning the masters and being a part of the history here and watching Seve Ballesteros, you know, win in, in uh, the early eighties twice and, pumping his fist and the charisma. Like it was my dream uh, to, to win here, to be a part of the history here. And uh, the way now that I've, now that I have one and I'm part of the history, the way that I get treated here is, is second to none. I'm just very appreciative of uh, the way they've treated me. I, years ago, I made a statement um, tax wise, California, big mistake, got into politics, not going to do it again. So uh, I have my beliefs and I'm going to live my life according to those beliefs. And I'm going to try to treat people the right way. And, and um, you know, without discrimination, that's the best I can do is lead by example. But um, uh, I'm not going to uh, get into politics. It's, uh, it's uh, never goes well. William. Uh, Phil, over 100 trips now around this place, uh, the 12th hole, the, all those rounds. Uh, you mentioned respect earlier about the course. That hole's largely unchanged over the years, yet still can strike fear into a player, especially on Sunday afternoon. What makes that hole so great? The possibility of such a huge discrepancy in score makes that hole so great from a two to we've seen, you know, large numbers, but a five, two to five is very realistic, right? So, um, it's a little bit different in that 
the way I and other left-handed players view some of the holes and some of the shots where we have to be aggressive, where we have to be defensive is different than a right-handed player based on our shot dispersion. And, and number 12 is a hole that sets up much better along the shot dispersion of a left-handed golfer than it does a right-handed player. So for me to be able to aim at the right side of the green, right center of the green, and if I pull it and it goes, it's going to go a little bit longer into the right and still carry the water. And if I come out of it, it's going to go a little shorter left and, and get on the green. So I view 12 is where I've got to start getting aggressive. I actually view it as a, a birdie hole. I've got to get after that pin. Whereas a right-handed player, if they come out of it, it's short right, it's going to hit the bank, go in the water. And if they pull it, it's going to go long left into that back bank, and it's very hard up and down. And so that's one of the shots that you have to be very defensive on, right? And conversely, number 11 is the opposite. Like 11, you, as a right-handed player, it sets perfectly for, for that dispersion. For me, that's a really hard hole. That's a really hard second shot. There's no miss. You know, short left, water, long right, very tough up and down. I've got to hit a great shot there. So the course plays a little bit differently from my eye than I think a lot of guys historically. And 12 is where most people have to be defensive, but it's where I, I think it's, it's go time. Ryan? Well, I, I can't see from here. Is that a bandage or a splint on your finger? Oh, it's just tape. I just hit a lot of balls. It's just, I get calluses and cuts <clears throat> and whatever. I'm just taping. It's, it's fine. There's nothing there. Uh, and then secondly, uh, in your 29th appearance, is there anything you're still learning about this golf course? Um, and if so, can you offer any examples? Well, it changes all the time. So there's always little subtleties being changed in the greens and the teeing areas. Uh, the, the angle of the edge of the green, a little bit more severe, a little bit more severe upright. Little, you know, so all of these little subtleties I, I'm picking up on. Um, and I'm just becoming aware of it because it changes the shot just a little bit. Uh, as an example, um, you know, short left on 17, just short left of that bunker, the angle at which it, the, the fringe, it's just more vertical. And then it goes down before it gets to the green and then it goes back up. And so if you land it short, it's going to, it's going to kill it. Right. So you, you need to know that if you're trying to bounce one up or come in out, out of the rough that look, you got to land it five yards short of it. You can't land it two yards short of it because it'll hit a very severe upslope. It's little details like that, that I try to pick up on, make me aware so that, that if I do hit a good shot, it ends up where I expect and not be surprised. I'm sorry. We can't get to all your questions. Our, our time is up. Phil, thank one, you one so more much. For Mark, though. Is that cool? Is it? Sure. Go ahead. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just curious. You've been dabbling a little bit with with some of the Champions Tour stuff. Um, where are you at right now in terms of mixing more of that in? You know, I mean, I know you you know you talked about you know, your form has been good and the scores haven't been showing. You've had success over there a little bit. Is there is there a little bit of a tug of war taking place yet for you with that? So I've seen a lot of progress in my game without a lot of results. And so if I can, if I start getting the results, uh, you know, I, like I say, I enjoy the challenge of it. And the difficulty is, is when you're on a plateau and you're not really making advancements and you're putting in the work and putting in the work and you're not seeing the results to stay consistent and, and to stay committed. And if I'm, as I continue to do that, I need some results to, to keep me motivated to compete against the best players. Otherwise, I really enjoy the champion story. I enjoy having pins that are five from the edge and not two and a half and three. And I enjoy having a chance to short side yourself and still get up and down. And uh, I enjoy having 15 feet around the hole where you can have an aggressive putt and not having the pin on a, on a fall off ledge, like, like uh, you know, three feet from it, like we seem to have every week. And I enjoy being able to play more aggressive. So I'm having fun, a lot more fun than I thought on the champions tour, but yet the challenge that gets the best out of me is trying to play and compete against the best players. It's what gets me motivated to be in the gym and to try to be physically able to swing fast enough to compete against these guys and to, uh, be strong enough in my core to be able to practice as much as I need to and hit balls. Like you said on Sunday for hours and, and still be fine uh, and able to do that. So that's what drives me and motivates me. So I still want to have that challenge in my life because it brings the best out of me, but the Champions Tour is a lot more fun than I ever thought, and, and I enjoy playing uh, those events. And I will play some. I, I won't play, the, play it full time if I'm able, able to compete out here or feel I'm able to compete out here, but uh, I do enjoy them. Thanks. Phil, thank you very much. Thanks. We wish you the best this week. Thank you.